But that song. Good afternoon. <clears throat> and yes, indeed, it is afternoon. 12.30 on the dot on Friday afternoon. This is um, when I normally do my show. And my show is um, The Road to Recovery. And my show's about mental health. And I've been doing the show a long, long time now, about close on six years, I'd say. And um, it's been a long haul for me. Um, I've suffered from depression pretty much my whole life and it has been a real struggle but I still manage to achieve a lot of things. I managed to travel to the other side of the world and live over there and get back here and I've had a lot of different jobs over the years. I worked out 28 the other day, 28 different, distinctly different jobs that I've done um, in different areas over the years. <clears throat> so I've certainly had, <coughs> excuse me, an interesting time and a good life and that's one of the reasons why I do the show is to show people that just because you may be um, suffering from mental health issues that you might have struggles in life, it doesn't stop you from achieving anything in life and <clears throat> really what it comes down to is how much you want something. That determines, for the most part, whether you'll achieve it or not. Ability, yeah, to some degree, but tenacity is greater than ability. Um, often people who succeed are simply those that try the hardest and want it the most. And you need that. Life isn't easy and... No one ever said it was going to be. That's what my dad used to say. Who told you it was going to be easy? <laughs> oh, no, I never told me it was going to be this hard. But what I like to do is give some ideas to people on what I do to help myself. And, you know, I'm not saying that I have all the solutions for everybody. Everybody is different. And you've got to find your own way. But... Certainly I have found some success and made a lot of mistakes too, of course, and more than anything I hope that people can learn from my mistakes as much as, as gain from my successes. And the biggest mistake I probably made during that period of time was beating up on myself, listening to the negativity of others and allowing that to pervade, allowing that to leach into my life. And that was very destructive and pushed me to the brink of suicide for a couple of years. And sometimes holding on can be very destructive and letting go can be cathartic. It can really help you breathe again, help you live again. And I used to see this lady, Aruna Patel, and being of, of Indian descent, she was one of these sort of people that are very mindful. Um, like a lot of Southeast Asians... A lot of them are Buddhists and they are more aware probably than Westerners. Westerners tend to be self-serving and greedy and the more you have, the more you want and that seems to be the nature of our society and if you don't have enough, you're lesser and it's always about judging people and yet I find that people who come from extremely poor countries tend to worry about money less. Not having any in a way is a time for freedom. Yeah, it makes life difficult, sure it does. Life becomes a struggle but then when you do struggle in life the small things you get you appreciate so much more. Here in Aotearoa, we are 
in a paradise surrounded by magnificent things all around us. But unfortunately, so often we end up so busy and so careless of, of others and ourselves that we don't see all the beauty around us. We All we see is the darkness in our hearts and minds. And we get carried away with that. We move into cities, we live in buildings, we forget all the beauty that is around us. And during this period where we had this COVID lockdown, I think people have looked at their own country again through new eyes and realised truly what a paradise it is. And the more I see of it, the more I love it. And... I try to get out as much as I can. I drive through the countryside from Pahiatua to uh, Bastardon to do this show on Fridays, and I love driving through the countryside. I was born on a farm, grew up there, had uncles and aunts, uh, and went back and stayed with them for many years. So, you know, I had already had a great appreciation for the countryside, but... I find that I miss it more now than ever and it's really good I find for my mental health to go for walks, ride through the countryside on my bicycle so I can feel the wind in my face and I can hear the birds and go for walks down the rivers and I find that type of peace actually better, nicer than towns. I'm, I'm absolutely sick of people and towns, of the push and shove, of people being rude and ignorant and just so bloody selfish. I find it terrible and I find the countryside in a lot of ways cures me of, of the tension that I feel in the push and shove and busyness of, of cities, and I've lived in big cities. I lived in London for five years, and London's a hell of a lot busier and pushier than any town in New Zealand, including Auckland. Auckland is a sprawling mass, whereas London, it's a sprawling mass, but there is a, definitely a heart in there. If you go into Piccadilly and round Trafalgar Square area, it's it's a busy old place all the way around the Thames basically, both sides pretty much these days, it's, um, it's a hell of a busy place and you know, the busier people are, it, it seems the less time they have for each other, which is a real shame, you know the way that we treat each other and, and indeed ourselves to a large degree with disregard. And so what I try to do and what I recommend if, you, if you're having problems with your mental health is just to take it easy on yourself a bit more and make the time to get away from the television and to get out you know, not that long ago we had some pretty shitty weather and I went for a walk in the rain. I didn't have to, you know. I got a car, I didn't have to go walking in the rain, but I thought it would be good for me and it was fair heaving down too. So I put on my riding coat and my wide-brimmed hat and I went for a rain and a walk in the, in the pissing rain and... It was actually really, really good. I really enjoyed it. Just taking my time and looking around, and it has been a very worthwhile exercise for me to try and get out more because when you're cold, you just want to stay inside, watch TV, having something nice to eat and staying warm. But I actually find that a bit of discomfort can make you appreciate those small comforts so, so much more. You know, you often take so much for granted because it's just there. Convenience. And I think people take their freedoms for granted. And I think that became quite prevalent during this COVID lockdown. 
once people were denied their freedom, suddenly they realised what they had before and what they've lost now. So perhaps we can gain something from that by realising what a wonderful thing these freedoms are that we have and how we really do take them for granted. You know, the opportunity to get out, even to go for a walk down your nearest river and just watch the birds and the fish and enjoy yourself with a bit of peace and quiet on your own to give yourself time to think, time to reflect upon things. And when you do so, think about positive things, good things, not the things that are swirling around, driving you crazy, worrying you sick. Yeah, we all have those things, all of us, every single one of us, even the children. So taking a bit of time out and just being a little bit gentle with yourself and spending a bit of peaceful time alone and thinking good thoughts, happy thoughts, you know, just getting lost in that moment and pushing all the busyness to one side and saying just for half an hour or so, I'm going to forget all of the worries in the world as much as I can. It's not always easy, but the more you do it, the more you practice it, the more you get good at allowing yourself a chance to breathe, a chance to look out across the horizon. I often like um, going up hills because you get that magical vista view across the land. And it's not easy. I'm pretty unfit these days. You know, I've been sick for a long time. In fact, I've had the flu for about the last three weeks, which just about killed me. It wasn't COVID, thank God, but it was it was pretty damn bad. And um, it's funny after you're sick how much you appreciate being well. And although I'm not 100% yet, I certainly feel a hell of a lot better than what I did. <laughs> and you'll have to excuse me a minute. <coughs> Blimey. Still hacking and coughing after three weeks. Lung infections, blood poisoning, not a good scene at all. But, you know, while I was sick, I allowed myself to daydream a little and think about getting out fishing again. I find fishing a a really, really, really um, valuable and, and, and in a way a medicinal thing almost, at least not so much for the body but for the soul as much as anything, for my heart, for my mind. I like the rhythm of the sea, that reassuring wash of the waves and... Catching something is always nice, and I've got pretty good at it. I've been doing it for about 50 years, so I should be pretty good at it by now. And it's one of those things where it's a kind of love-hate relationship. I don't, I don't like commercial fishing at all. It's just a nasty slog covered in blood and guts all day. Not my cup of tea at all. But being able to snap a roo, even one humble kahawai, I mean, they are a magnificent fish, massively underrated in New Zealand. And it's a shame because they, like all those creatures, deserve our protection. And, you know, if you can go out there and catch yourself a nice snapper or a gurnard or a kahawai, it's, it's wonderful to be able to catch it, kill it, fillet it, cook it, the whole nine yards yourself, you get a wonderful feeling of accomplishment and self-satisfaction and the knowledge that you can feed yourself because it's never a good thing when you're totally reliant on others to clothe you, house you, feed you, and you're just utterly dependent. And a lot of the time, when you are mentally ill, you end up, on the scrap heap, you're basically below the poverty line living on the dole, and believe you me, that's no fun when you're struggling like that. So being able to get out and have a fish when it costs you nothing, 
Well, that's that's a good, good thing. You know, it's a wonderful thing where we can all be equal and there are no greater and lesser. We can all get out there and enjoy this wonderful country. And, you know, I remember many years ago when I was on the rock and roll, I used to hitchhike all around New Zealand and I had a wonderful old time. Um, fishing all kinds of spots and met a lot of interesting people along the way. Well, I don't just talk about going for walks and rivers and fishing. I um, read my stories from around New Zealand and around the world. This particular one I'm going to read today is called Top of the South, which is actually about our country and specifically the Top of the South Island, which... I love so much. In fact, this is called Top of the South, a place in my heart. I'm going to have to kick on to get through it in 28 minutes, but let's do it. Let's rock. My family moved to Wellington in 69. We got our first house in Lower Hutt in 70, and in that year I took my first ferry ride from the capital across Quick Strait to Queen Charlotte Sound in Picton. I was only six years old and had not seen very much of the world. Heading down Tory Channel in the lower half of Queen Charlotte was like a strange dream. I thought to myself, there cannot be a more spectacular or beautiful place on earth. Back in the day, many folks had a batch in the bush or by the sea, but we were too poor for such a luxury. Instead, poor folks like us could take a cheap day trip to Picton, eat some fish and chips, and dream what it would be like to spend the Christmas holidays in this beautiful place. A couple of bays up from the little town of Picton, there was a school of huge tame snapper. They would ferry up boats of tourists to feed them and take photos of these huge old fish who seemed to like showing off, turning on their sides on the surface of the water as they grabbed a mouthful of food. These beautiful creatures were from about 70 to a good 100 years old. Some years later, some greedy a-hole killed them all, and we all knew we would never see that kind of amazing sight ever again. Fishing was still good in Queen Charlotte in the early 70s, and I heard the legends of places like Kenna Peru and Pelora Sound, but it was to be many years before I got to the outer sounds. Over the next few years, I got down to Queen Charlotte a few times and got out fishing on the day charters out of Picton. It was wonderful to catch blue cod and snapper, and, and in those days the crew would fetch a sack of parwa for us at low tide. My dad wasn't really into fishing, but I had been in love with it since I was three, and I learned everything I could from the skippers off the charters. Fishermen always play their cards pretty close to their chests, but I think they could see I was just fizzing with enthusiasm, so they became my first mentors in the fishing game. Back home, I began diving with a mate from the age of 12. We had no wetsuits, but we were young and enthusiastic. All we needed was a mask. I fished around Wellington Harbour with my mates as often as I could, first on hand lines made out of old glass Coca-Cola bottles. They were perfect when we were young, but for my 12th birthday my dad bought me a surf caster and reel, and I never looked back. But always I was dreaming of the sounds and wondered what lay beyond them. In second form, my whole class went for a school trip to the top of the south. We went to Picton, Blenheim, Lake Grasmere and then over to Havelock and Canvas Town. We got out as far as Polaris Bridge and I had a wonderful time. That trip really affected me deeply and I knew I would always have a special connection with this most beautiful part of the world. At the end of my 15th year, my dad took me down to the Bay of Many Coves on the west side of Queen Charlotte. It was a reward for passing my school cert, and we went down for a week. It was the only holiday we ever went on together, but it was the best I could possibly have hoped for. I talked to a few blokes over there who told me how to catch tarakihi in the cove, and Dad and I hired a dinghy, and I slayed myself over a dozen. 
Dad wasn't quick enough to catch the fast Tiraki, but even he managed to snaffle a real nice kawai. When we got back to shore, I had to fill at the fish and got smothered in hungry wasps all over my fish, hands, arms and face. After an hour or so, a charter pulled up to the jetty and the skipper asked if anyone wanted a flounder for dinner. My dad was standing there and told me to ask the skipper, so I piped up. You'll have to wade in and get it, because it's right down here by the boat, he told me. So I waded in with my knife, following his directions. I spotted the flounder, but the little bugger kept scooting off every time I came close. I carefully followed it for about 30 metres, then it turned and started to go deeper. I knew it was now or never. I had to go under the water with my glasses and jersey on and lunged at the fish that had hesitated just for a mo. To my amazement, I got him right through the middle and got my other hand under him and waded to shore with a flapping lemon sole pinned on my knife to the cheers of those around. My dad didn't say a thing, but I could see the look of pride on his face. That night he insisted I cook and eat all of that delicious fish and we drank wine and chatted long into the night. It was the closest I ever got to my father, a trip I will treasure forever. Over the next four years I got down there a few more times but never got further than the portage in Kenaparu. Then, when I turned 20, I was sent to outward bound in Anakiwa by my work. Anakiwa is right at the toe of Queen Charlotte and I learned a lot about the place in the six weeks I spent slogging my guts out on that course in the middle of winter. We kayaked the flooded Proloris River for a few days, tramped the mountains and camped out solo in far-flung bays. We also sailed an old whaler up Queen Charlotte to Endeavour Inlet in the storms of winter, camping at night on empty beaches. The more I learned of this magic place, the more I came to love it. The next year I headed overseas and was gone for the next seven and a half years. Often I would tell my friends in London of the beauty of the top of the south and I always knew I would be back there one day. When I returned to New Zealand, I mucked around Wellington for a year then decided to go down to Motueka to give the fruit picking a go. I lived there for just over a year and kept myself real busy exploring that side of the top. As far south as Ruby Bay, Mootery and Tasman, I ventured into the hills and up to Rewalker and Kai Territory and Marahau on the coast of Tasman Bay. The sand on the beaches there is the most beautiful golden sand. It's a really special place. I walked the Abel Tasman National Park and later on went flatting at David Barth's place and we ventured even further afield, over the treacherous Takaka Hill with the amazing Harwoods Hole and on to Takaka and Collingwood in that very special part of the country. We travelled right around the north of Kaharangi National Park to the west coast and the end of the road. We did some possum trapping, and collected native flowers for polyurethane paperweights that David made. I could only handle a year of fruit picking and sadly returned to my old stomping ground of Lower Hut. A year later I went back to Queen Charlotte Sound and stayed with some friends at a batch. We cruised in my mate's launch to the end of Queen Charlotte and caught some huge gurnard. It was nice to be back there and I knew this place had truly become part of the fabric of my life. My me- next trip was with my mates Murray and Marty. We drove round to Ballorus Bridge, just past Havelock, and stayed the night. The next day we headed up the Rye Valley Road via O'Kiwi Bay to French Pass. The road was really narrow and windy to begin with and only got worse. The last part was little more than a single lane cut through the side of a huge high hillside. The wind blasted the dust to a blinding storm and I had to finish the drive at night looking sideways at the bank to stop me driving off the side of the hill. We had a great time catching blue cod and French pass and snapper in Admiralty Bay. Finally I had to go to the top of the sounds and I knew I would be back there sometime soon. 
After that, I met up with a work buddy, Brendan, whose parents had a patch of land at the end of Endeavour Inlet, at the end of Queen Charlotte Sound. We stayed there for a week, fishing for blue cod and walking around the inlet at night to Endeavour Lodge to get on the beers. It's a beautiful place with glowworms on the track and beautiful bush all round. I suppose there's a bit of a cloud hanging over the place because of the murders of Olivia Hope and Ben Smart on that New Year's Day. The whole place has a bit of a tainted past, but there is something undeniably magnificent about the place, and I felt a pang of regret having to leave. Okay, I'm just going to have to jump ahead a little bit. The last trip... Okay, here we go. I got distracted for the next few days as I just got here, but let's just jump ahead. Sorry about this, but I'm never going to fit it in otherwise. I went on holiday with my wife over the Taku Hill to Pohara and um, a beautiful campsite of Totranui right across to Collingwood and Farewell Spit and all round the top there. Then I got distracted for the next few years. Doing up my house, got myself a dog, and I went back down to the Polaris Bridge and up Rye Valley Road and onto Okiwi Bay. I got some real good snapper and then I went over to Elaine Bay, which is on the other side in Polaris and camped there for a week living on smoke blue cod and snapper one evening while cleaning my fish on the end of a jetty a stingray swam up and started eating the discarded fish guts right beside me he started rubbing right up against me like a dog I started feeding him by hand and then hopped in the water with him soon all his mates came over keen for a feed they're all over me, these stingrays, rubbing themselves against my legs and arms. It was really freaky and I was glad to have a wetsuit on. Still, it was an evening I will never forget. The last trip I went on should have cost me my life. I had always wanted to own a proper launch. A 30-footer that I could cruise the sounds in and get to the outer reaches that I had never explored. I planned to take the launch back to Wellington and visit the top of the south as often as I could by sailing over the strait from the capital. Unfortunately, I broke down just outside Tory, and then on my second attempt, smashed the thing to pieces in a spring storm out in the middle of Cook Strait, coming off the top of a five-metre monster wave. So unfortunately, I had to give up the launch. It's been a few years now since I last ventured south and I can feel that eternal pull from the top. It's only a matter of time till I answer the call of the place I've come to love so much. The end. Well, it's me for another week. Many thanks to Michael and Veronica for putting up with me, to Wairapa TV and to all the sponsors. Thank you all very much. Um, I know you had some terrible floods up in the Hawke's Bay. My prayers are with you. I hope everything works out for you real good real soon. Um, you know, support those people. They're really going to need it in these tough times. So stick together, eh? Thanks, and I'll see you next week. Bye for now.